Let's get started. The last talk. I hope, I hope you still have some energy. Um, wow. There it is. All right, so this talk is about, um, well, it's called Scaling Up Flakes, and it's about uh, fixing uh, one of the issues that is preventing flakes from being stabilized, uh, namely a problem that a lot of people run into when they try to flakeify uh, their project. Uh, so if you have some ha big repositories, then it turns out that flakes don't work very well. Uh, because, as it turns out, that Nix has this tendency of copying entire repositories to the Nix store every time. And uh, what a surprise, that doesn't scale. So um, this talk is about fixing that. And that, uh, yeah, uh, takes away one of the big blockers for uh, stabilizing flakes. Uh, so just a reminder of what flakes are for people who have never seen them. Uh, so a flake is basically just a source tree, like a Git repository. Uh, that has a file named flake.nix in it. And uh, this is a standard way of packaging projects that have Nix expressions in them. So where you previously might have a default.nix or a shell.nix, uh, flake.nix uh, standardizes that. It uh, gives a way for these flakes to have dependencies on other flakes. Uh, so you don't need to have this sort of uh, mono repo anymore. Um, and it's a uh, uh, in addition to dependencies on our flakes, uh, flakes, of course, have so-called outputs, which are arbitrary Nix values like uh, packages or uh, developer environments or Hydra jobs or whatever you want to export. Uh, the flake format doesn't really care about that. Uh, and like I said, uh, source trees can be uh, uh, Git repositories, but also tarballs or paths in the local file system, uh, but usually they're Git repositories. Um, so th this talk is actually not really about flakes, it's about uh, uh, fetch tree, which is sort of the operation that underlies flakes. Uh, fetch tree uh, fetches a so-called input, which could be a Git repository or a path. Um, and uh, yeah, so what's the problem? Uh, so the problem is large source trees, because Nix currently copies every flake or every uh, tree uh, to the Nix store. So uh, regardless of what you do with the flake, uh, it ends up being copied to the Nix store. So if you do something like Nix flake metadata on uh, uh, an arbitrary flake, as you see over here, uh, that ends up uh, in the Nix store. So if that is a multi-gigabyte uh, Git repository, uh, then every time you run Nix, it will first uh, copy uh, all those gigabytes of data to the Nix store. Um, if you make one, uh, one character edit to your repository, well, then you end up with a new multi-gigabyte copy in the Nix store. So this is, uh, this is not very scalable. Um, and this is not just your top-level flake. It's also all the dependencies, like Nix packages. So you end up with a lot of copies of Nix packages in your uh, Nix store. Uh, and disk space may be cheap, but it's, it's not that cheap. Um, yeah, so in particular, this makes hacking on large flakes very slow. So Nix packages is, is, a, is not even that huge of a repository, but it's already big enough that um, uh, hacking in sort of on Nix packages in, in the flake way, uh, using the new CLI, so you have saying Nix build dot hash hello, uh, takes several seconds because it needs to copy the entire uh, Nix packages flake to the Nix store. Uh, and yeah, like I said, it costs a lot of disk space. Uh, so for example, here 93 gigab uh, megabytes. Uh, that's actually on ZFS, which compresses things automatically on file systems like X4, which uh, doesn't compress things and which has big cluster sizes. Uh, a Nix packages copy might be a few hundred uh, uh, megabytes. Uh, and of course, like I said, this multiplies every time you make any change to this flake. So that's terrible. Because the awaiter uh, works on these uh, copied uh, source trees, you get error messages that refer to the Nix store rather than to the original location. Uh, now, 
often there might not really be a sensible original location uh, because if, say, you're using a GitHub flake, uh, that flake didn't exist in your local file system anyway, so it's not really clear what sensible error message it should give, but uh, an error message that just says slash nix slash tor slash hash dash source, uh, yeah, good luck figuring out what uh, flake that actually is. So uh, this is not very user friendly. Uh, but in the particular case of when you're uh, hacking on a local Git flake, uh, if, for example, you, uh, you add a new source file, but you forget to Git add it, uh, it won't be a, a copy to the Nix store uh, because uh, Nix tries to be sort of uh, hermetic. Um, and so you get a mysterious error message. You get no such file or directory and you're left scratching your head and thinking, but this file exists in my repository, so what's going on here? Um, so, uh, because I was lazy, uh, but the, uh, the, the underlying reason is that Nix wants to ensure yeah, reproducible and hermetic evaluation. So. Uh, that, that was actually one of the main goals for flakes. Uh, so in the in the in the pre-flake days, um, if, if you had your project, uh, you might rely on the Nix path environment variable to find Nix packages, and then two developers uh, clone this repository and they both try to build it. Uh, and they might have a different version of Nix packages on their Nix path. Uh, so they get a different result, uh, and that is what we uh, really wanted to avoid. So Nix was good at ensuring reproducible builds, but it wasn't very good at ensuring reproducible uh, evaluation. Um, so the easy way to ensure uh, that uh, evaluation was unaffected by any sort of, say, pollution you might have in your uh, Git work tree, like uh, uh, unadded files, um, uh, or that you have references to outside of the tree, like dot dot slash uh, some file dot nix, uh, was to just copy everything to the nix store, um, and uh, yeah, that was uh, uh, pretty easy, but it doesn't scale. So the better solution is something called lazy source trees, which I've been working on for a while. Um, it's uh, in a pull request. It's ready for review now, so uh, everybody is welcome to try to uh, uh, find bugs in this. Um, and the main idea is to, uh, yeah, not copy source trees to the store. Uh, but of course, we still need to uh, uh, maintain hermetic evaluation, uh, and uh, we want a, a couple of other advantages that I'll uh, I'll show. Uh, now, I'll talk a bit later about uh, the implementation details, but the idea is that uh, uh, we have a sort of internally inside of Nix, there is a sort of virtual file system abstraction for accessing the source code of flakes uh, and different types of flakes, like a GitHub flake or a local file system flake, uh, have different uh, uh, accessors uh, that, uh, yeah, to, to lazily uh, read. Uh, files like Nix expressions. So this is what it looks like in practice. So uh, uh, yeah, if I'm hacking on the Nix packages flake, so a, a git work tree, uh, yeah, now a Nix build, uh, yeah, is a lot faster, uh, 0.2 seconds. So it's not uh, copying the Nix packages flake to the, the Nix store anymore. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, that's awesome. Uh, so what does this mean? Uh, well, let's look at the REPL. Uh, let's uh, fetch a tree uh, from GitHub, uh, namely the patch elf repository. Uh, so, uh, with uh, uh, pre lazy trees. So, fetch tree no longer returns an, uh, an adder set with a out path referring to the next store. But instead, it has this sort of magic value, uh, which is actually, if you print it in the REPL, it will say, yeah, GitHub colon NixOS slash patch elf slash a particular revision uh, slash. So this magic value actually, yeah, is a reference to um, uh, 
I mean, it, it, so it provides provenance. So it, it knows where it came from, so it can provide uh, useful um, uh, references. Uh, but so this outpath uh, is uh, yeah, an internal value, like I said. Uh, so nothing gets copied to the Nix store unless you ask for it. Now, if I do something like uh, add uh, the string slash readme.md, uh, I get a value that represents yeah, the file readme.md inside of that source tree, uh, which is still uh, lazily fetched. So still nothing has been uh, copied. Now, only if I do something like an empty quotation, uh, like a uh, string, uh, so quote dollar tree. Uh, so if I'm trying to pass something as an input to a derivation, uh, well, then, then the derivation, of course, needs to be able to read the source tree. So it needs to be in the next store. Uh, so, so then it will get copied. But if you don't do that, uh, then uh, uh, it doesn't happen. So now, uh, since we now have all this provenance information, so we know where these, uh, the, these path references actually came from, uh, we can get better error messages. So for example, if I try to uh, do this next build on, and, and, and I, uh, uh, so I created this file, uh, my package, but I forgot to git add it. Uh, so it will actually say that. So it will say access to path is forbidden because it is not under git control. Maybe you should git add it. Uh, or, uh, if it really doesn't exist, then it will say that. It will say, path, my package does not exist in this Git repository. Um, yeah, so much nicer error message. Um, but also in uh, stack traces and user thrown errors. Um, so, for example, if I have a NixOS configuration where I'm referring to Steam, which is not allowed, so previously, I would get an error message like package steam in slash nix slash store has an unfree license. And now I get package steam in uh, GitHub nix OS slash nix package slash revision, blah, 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 uh, has an unfree license. So, uh, yeah, this is uh, uh, much nicer. Okay, but that's not all. We now have a uh, built-in dot patch operator, which uh, takes a source tree, which is lazy, and applies some patches to it, uh, and returns a tree that is also lazy. So previously, if you wanted to, for instance, patch Nix packages, uh, well, at first you need to materialize Nix packages to disk, which takes a few hundred megabytes. And then you need to apply a patch, and then that gets copied to the Nix store, so it takes another few hundred megabytes. Uh, so it's very slow, and it takes a lot of disk space. Um, but this operation, yeah, since it takes a lazy source tree and returns a lazy source tree, uh, it, it doesn't materialize anything to disk unless you ask for it. So, um, um, yeah, so here I have this uh, patched, which is source tree that takes the patch shell source tree and applies a patch to it. I'm using the word patch too often here. Maybe I shouldn't have used patch, patch elf as an example here. It gets a bit ambiguous. Uh, uh, yeah, and then when I do build install read file to read a file from that source tree, then it will actually look whether it has a patch that applies to that particular source file and apply it in memory. Um, and uh, yeah. All right, now a little bit about the implementation, how this works, uh, because that ha actually has some to an absolute path in the local file system, but there are, they are tuples uh, of input accessor comma path. Um, and an input accessor is this thing that refers to, for instance, a GitHub repository or a, um, a, a Git repository or Mercurial or whatever. Uh, and the path here is the uh, path underneath that source tree. So uh, in that flake, usually. Uh, so it has a bunch of operations on, on this app file system abstraction, like, for example, read file, uh, which, yeah, given a, uh, one of these paths inside this flake, will return a string. Um, yeah, and there are a bunch of implementers, like uh, there is a, input accessor for the local file system, for zip files, for 
applying patches, uh, yeah, and a couple others. Uh, so, for example, suppose I'm evaluating uh, uh, something from uh, the local file system, but not a Git work tree, so just a path flake. Uh, that will use the FS input accessor with the top of my flake as the root. Uh, and FS input accessor uh, applies access control. So it's, it, uh, if you try to do dot dot slash to escape out of the root, that doesn't work. Um, so uh, yeah, this ensures that you cannot uh, uh, gain access to something that is uh, not part of the flake. Um, Git work trees are actually also implemented using FS input accessor, uh, which also has a feature of, uh, it, it, yeah, it has a set of files that you're allowed to access. So in the get, case of a Git work tree, that is the files that are under Git control. Uh, so if you um, uh, uh, try to access a file that doesn't exist, it can give you a useful error message. That's how it's implemented. Uh, now, GitHub repository, so here there's a big change. So GitHub flakes used to be implemented by downloading a tarball, unpacking it, and copying it to the Nick store. Uh, now it downloads a zip file, and it doesn't copy it. Or it doesn't unpack it, and it certainly doesn't copy it to the Nick store. So there is a zip input accessor uh, that will uh, directly extract files from the zip file. Uh, and the reason for using a zip file instead of a tarball is that zip files are random access and tarballs are not. Uh, so this uh, saves a lot of uh, disk space and CPU time depending on uh, your system. <coughs> All right, um, and similarly, there is a patching input accessor that takes that wraps an arbitrary uh, uh, accessor uh, and uh, yeah, uh, so, for example, if you do a read file operation, it will call the underlying read file and then apply a patch to it. Um, all right, so this uh, does have some, causes some incompatible changes. Uh, the main one is that uh, flake log files no longer have a nar hash attribute, at least not for all inputs. Uh, so uh, this is a backwards, uh, a backwards compatible change. So if you have a flake with a nar hash attribute in it, that still works. But if you uh, take a new flake and try to run it on an old mix, it, it will complain about a missing nar hash attribute. Uh, and the reason is that uh, computing the nar hash attribute uh, is too expensive because by definition that requires the entire source tree to be read. And that of course was the exact thing that we were trying to avoid. Uh, so uh, it now relies on other attributes to lock the input, like the, the Git revision. Uh, there are some other incompatibilities, uh, so it's not super likely that you run into them. Uh, but uh, so, for example, path values, since they no longer necessarily have a representation in the local file system, uh, to string uh, no longer necessarily gives a useful result. So if you do something like to string tree, and tree is not a local file system flake, then you get something like underscore virtual. Um, and uh, yeah, and, okay. Uh, have sort of uh, non-flake code, uh, or if and if you're not using fetch tree. Uh, and since both of those things are experimental, we can sort of get away with uh, changing the behavior here. Um, yeah, and similarly, uh, so there is a breaking change that occurs kind of frequently, uh, but we're working on a fix for that. Uh, but if since flake inputs are no longer in the in the next store, at lib dot is store path will return false, uh, whereas previously it returned true. And even though it can be coerced into something that is in the next store. Uh, if, if you're do, doing this as a type check, as uh, certain uh, types in, in the NixOS module system uh, do, uh, uh, it might break. Okay, um, that's, that's what it currently does. There are some future improvements like, uh, uh, so Git uh, repositories are actually still copied to the Nix store. Um, except when you're using a working tree. 
Um, but so in the future, maybe we can use libgit to uh, in the same way as we're using libzip. Um, and uh, yeah, that would be very nice. Um, and yeah, RNF, yeah, uh, should merge it. Um, okay, that's, that's about it. Any questions? It. Ah, there we go. Are there questions? Oh, wow. Uh, so one question I have is um, these virtual, like the underscore virtual underscore path kind of types, um, are they going to be unique or mm -hmm. uh, because you had like underscore virtual underscore uh, dash four or something, right? Um, so for, for two different previously yeah. store paths, will you have unique... Um, uh, unique virtual paths. Yeah, so I, I guess the underlying question here is, is this completely reproducible? Uh, and currently it is not. So uh, that number four could actually be something different. Uh, so I have actually some ideas about it, or I had an idea and then I forgot it. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but as a follow -up, during, one, during one evaluation, will they at least stay unique? Or uh, yes. No, just yeah. not over... Yeah. Right. Um, there's two in the group here. Um, so without the NAR hash, but with uh, Git revisions, for instance, it's relatively easy to get hash collisions, right? And ones that mean that you can no longer guarantee that if two people build it uh, with the lock file, you'll actually get to see the same thing. I mean, it can have a Git repo that produces something with a Git collision, right? Uh, I didn't entirely hear it, but it, it, so it's about the NAR hash, and can you still guarantee that uh, it's the same thing? Yeah, because because we're using SHA-1 for, for Git revisions instead of SHA-256 for NAR hashes, right? Uh, uh, say again? So it's, it's easier to get a, a hash collision with Git revisions, right? Uh, um, right. Yes, <laughs> it is. Um, uh, yes, that, that's true, and uh, uh, I would sort of say uh, that's a problem for Git to solve, so maybe <laughs> uh, maybe they're going to switch to something else. Uh, I, I understand they've been thinking about it for 10 years or so, uh, but uh, I mean, if it's good enough for Git, then it's sort of good enough for us. So m maybe uh, we can still have a flag to really force locking by having a NAR hash there, uh, because that actually has some other useful properties, like it makes the source tree substitutable from a binary cache. Without the NAR hash, you cannot substitute it. OK. Um, is this the last step before removing the experimental flag? Uh, no, for that, we should do an NAR So I haven't taken a lot of questions from this side. I'm sorry. So I will now. Um, the, the, there is a, an evaluation cache for for Flex that allows you to like bypass the evaluation and just fetch from the database the result for some attributes. Can you restore that feature with the lazy file system, or can you just disable the lazy thing and force to upload everything so that you have all, the, all of the ashes and you can still access that evaluation cache? I, I heard part of it. So it was <laughs> about the evaluation cache. And uh, I mean, so the evaluation cache still works. How does it work if you don't know if like the inputs are the same? Oh, well, I mean, using the same mechanism as <coughs> uh, log files. So the top level flake should be locked in some way. But if you have a, a, a so right, so you don't get uh, evaluation caching on a dirty uh, uh, Git work tree, but that was already not the case. Um, well, that's sort of similar to this NAR hash uh, issue. So maybe you could have a way, an attribute to force um, uh, locking. Uh...
Um, yeah. in, in, in principle, uh, yes, that is possible. Yeah, so you could have a, a clean uh, Git tree and then you start modifying after Nix has determined that it's clean. I think that falls under the don't do that category. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, you're right. But but in that case, at least the NAR hash would still reflect the the sort of the the, the dirty state of <laughs> Right. Thank you, Yoko. I put away the mic already, so I'm sorry. All right. Thank you.